the structure and properties of solids. We can classify substances, different types of substances, based on the types of bonds that they have, um, as well as the macroscopic properties that arise from the arrangement of the parts that make them up. So think of the, the atoms that are um, bonded within them um, and the properties that arise from that. There are amorphous solids, which, as the name would suggest, uh, amorphous. So they don't have a particular shape to them uh, in terms of the arrangement of their component parts. And so think of it like a, a disorganized arrangement of the molecules within it, which have their advantages. So things like rubber, the fact that those molecules that make up rubber um, are, are arranged in different patterns allows them to sort of be coiled and then you can pull them tight and then they will bounce back to their original shape. Um, so amorphous solids are great, uh, but what we're here to talk about is crystalline solids. So these are the more simple ones. They have a repeating pattern of whatever it is that they're made up of. So we're gonna look at the different particles that you can use to make these solids, how those particles interact with each other, and how that dictates the properties of the particular solid we're talking about. We're gonna look at five of them. So the first one is not one you'd probably ever encounter. Um, you can think of it as a uh, more of a theoretical thing than, than something you'd actually be dealing with. But you can imagine if you had just atoms. So if the particles that make up these solids are strictly atoms, um, they're not gonna have a whole lot of reason to why they'd be attracted to each other, or essentially the forces between the atoms are going to be really, really low. So we're, we're talking about uh, London forces in that case. So a very weak force um, when you're dealing with something as small as an atom. London forces do build up. So if you've got really big molecules, London forces play a big role in the structure that holds those compounds together or those, those substances together. Uh, but when you're dealing with atoms, even big atoms aren't all that big. And so if the only force that would attract one atom to another is a London force, they're not going to be that attracted to each other. So if you want to make a solid out of these things, they'd have to be at incredibly low temperatures because any energy at all would cause these atoms to start moving apart from each other because the forces that hold them together are so, so low. So very, very low melting point and then a slightly higher but still very low boiling point. So think of these guys as the noble gases in a solid state. So take your favorite noble gas, um, so imagine argon, and it is an atom. If you had another atom of argon near it, generally the force between them is so weak, but theoretically if you get them cold enough, they should be able to get close enough together that the force of attraction between the particles, because remember all particles have attractive forces to each other. Um, so that force of attraction at some point would be great enough to hold them together as a solid, though, though we're talking about not a real solid. Um, molecular solids, um, these are gonna be bigger than atomic solids because obviously as a molecule, you're gonna have to be made up of several different atoms. And we're gonna look at two major types, the nonpolar ones and then polar molecules. So imagine if you had a nonpolar molecule, the forces that hold it together are gonna to be relatively low. So there's still gonna be London dispersion forces, but because we're dealing with a group of atoms now, the London dispersion forces are gonna be greater. You've got more uh, protons and you've got more electrons, and therefore there will be more attraction than there was at the atomic solid level. Still though, very weak. Um, low melting point and boiling point as well. And so you can imagine if you took a, a uh, methane molecule, so you've got your four hydrogens attached to your carbon, then this molecule is going to be a nonpolar molecule, nice and symmetrical. Um, and so there, there's no polarity to it. So if you had one methane molecule and a second methane molecule, they're bigger than atoms, so they have greater London forces. So the attractive force of one towards the other one are, is, is going to be somewhat greater, but still very, very weak. It's only dispersion forces. If you start getting bigger and bigger and bigger molecules, the dispersion forces will also start to increase, but generally speaking, it will be relatively weak. If, however, you get a molecule with some polarity to it, that dipole that exists on the molecule is going to be attracted to the opposite end of the dipole on another molecule. 
So if you saw um, instead of methane, maybe you had a, let's say, a, a carbon with a OH group on it. Now let's put the other hydrogens on, the other hydrogens on. Um, this polarity that you're going to see there, so we have this positive end and that negative oxygen there. And then again, we're going to have a little bit of polarity between the carbon and the oxygen as well. Um, that is going to create a partially negative charge where the oxygen is. The hydrogen will end up with a partially positive charge for sure. So you definitely get a dipole existing within that molecule, hence a polar molecule. So if it came a near another molecule like it, it would be attracted to that molecule. Um, water is a classic example of this. It has a specific type of polarity that, that is so strong um, called hydrogen bonding. And therefore the boiling point and melting point are, is going to be much, much higher in these guys because they're not just relying on those London dispersion forces, but they have this polarity to them, which is going to be very attracted to other molecules. So let's take an example of that. Um, if we had propane and formic acid. So if we compare these two molecules, they're not all that different in size. Um, they, they've got about the same, roughly, uh, number of protons and, and electrons in them. So the, the London forces possible are about equal. However, formic acid has this dipole in it between the hydrogen and the oxygen. Um, as well as there's going to be some between the oxygen and the carbon as well, but let's focus on, on this particular dipole. Um, so therefore, if you had a bunch of these formic acid molecules together in a, in a bottle, they're going to be quite attracted to each other relative to a nonpolar propane molecule. So the melting point for a propane is going to be at negative 90 degrees Celsius, so quite cold. It, it doesn't need much energy to separate solid propane and turn it into a liquid. Whereas formic acid, you've got to get it all the way up to eight degrees Celsius, it's much, much, much higher, almost 200 degrees higher, before you can actually separate a molecule of formic acid from another molecule of formic acid, because the force between them is going to be much, much greater because of the polarity. If you had two molecules of propane, so imagine there's another one there, um, the forces between them are just London forces, and though you're starting to get bigger molecules, that force is very weak, and therefore it's going to have a much lower melting point. Network solids, the third one here. Um, as the name suggests, these form a network, and we're going to look at two basic types, um, but they can form two-dimensional networks or three-dimensional networks, and it has a big effect on their properties. First one is elemental network solids. And so the most popular one of these would be a, a carbon-based elemental network solid. And essentially what that is, is you have a carbon and it would be bonded to other carbons. And those carbons would be bonded to other carbons, which would be bonded to other carbons. So you've got this whole network of carbons all bonded to each other. And how they are bonded is going to dictate their properties as well as their shapes. So graphite is made up of carbon bonded to three other carbons. And so we end up forming a network between these carbons that is two-dimensional. Let's see if I got this right. Um, so on. And you can imagine each one of these is bonded to three other carbons. And so we're going to end up with a network of carbons that is flat. We have a trigonal planar arrangement around each carbon. And so you're going to end up with sheets forming. And so we see these sheets up here that are flat. Now, Obviously, carbon is not going to be very stable, just three bonds. And so how it does this is it actually has these double bonds that are going to exist between the carbons um, in order to stabilize the bonding of the, those carbons themselves. That double bond is really important because essentially, whether it's in one place, so whether it, that double bond is here or here, uh, doesn't matter. And as we know, when it doesn't matter where the double bonds are, oh, there's already one there. Um, what that means is they're going to be able to resonate between the different places. So this double bond essentially can resonate around the structure. And since the structure is not just one ring, but it's an entire network, those double bonds are able to resonate across the entire sheet and move essentially electrons from one end of the sheet to the other end of the sheet because of that resonance of the double bond. So this allows graphite to be 
conductive because of the bonding, giving it a double bond, the double bond is able to be delocalized or resonate, and essentially that allows current to pass through this material. So it is a non-metal that is conductive. The sheets themselves are only held together with a, they're not bonded to each other, so they're only held together with London forces. So you imagine if we had one sheet on top of the other sheet, they'll be somewhat attracted to each other, but very, very weakly relative to the bonding within the sheet. So the sheets themselves are very strong. The bonding between the sheet is really weak. It is just those London dispersion forces. And so they can move around relative to each other very easily. And that's another property you see of graphite with your pencil. Um, think of it as a big stack of sheets. And as you put your pencil to the paper and you just drag it across the paper, those sheets slide off of each other and get deposited. I guess it would be the bottom one that would slide off first if it's a pencil. Um, and they'd get deposited on the paper while the other ones move along to be deposited later. So it's sort of like spreading out a big stack of papers across your piece of paper. But the papers in this case are graphite. So graphene is interesting because unlike graphite, which is essentially a big block or stack of, of tiny little sheets, graphene is one large sheet. And so that ability to move electrons to those double bonds can happen over a long, uh, a big area. And this sheet is held together with covalent bonds. So it is an incredibly tough sheet because it is covalently bonded together. And it is essentially only one atom thick because this is a two dimensional network solid. And so we have a conductive, super thin, super strong sheet, which has a lot of possibilities as to what sort of things we could build with it. Diamond is another carbon based network. Um, and it is made the same thing as, as graphite. It's made out of carbon. However, instead of being two dimensionally bonded, each carbon is bonded to uh, other carbons, but in a tetrahedral shape. And so a three dimensional tetrahedral shape with that uh, 109 degree angles between the two carbons um, of any two carbons in the, in the structure there. And a same thing, a network, then each of those carbons in it is bonded to four other carbons as well, giving it the three dimensional shape, a little bit hard to draw quickly. Um, but you can get the idea that each of these carbons is bonded to four other carbons, um, giving it a three dimensional shape. And there are no double bonds in here, so there is no ability to move those electrons. There's no, no um, lone pairs of electrons that are available for double bonding, so there's no resonance, there's no conductivity. Um, but like the graphene sheets, it is held together with these covalent bonds, which are very, very strong. So diamond itself is the hardest naturally occurring substance because none of these carbons are very easy to move. If you try to move one, you've got to break three bonds between it and some other carbon, or sorry, four bonds between it and some other carbon, which is gonna be very, very difficult to do or take a fair amount of energy to do. So a very hard substance to move the components within it. The other type is a compound based network solid. And essentially it's the same idea as a atomic base, but instead of just one atom repeating itself, it's gonna be a group of atoms that repeat themselves. So more than one type of element, but still a repeating pattern. So some examples of this would be quartz is a, a very common example. So if you imagine a, a silicon atom bonded to two oxygens as a unit, and then repeat that over and over and over and over and over again. Um, so each of these would be bonded to another oxygen, which is itself bonded to another silicon, which is itself bonded to another oxygen. And it's going to continue over and over and over again. So it is a repeating network of these covalent bonds. And again, this explains why it has such a high melting point. If you want to move any of these atoms relative to each other, it's going to require an extreme amount of energy. So you end up with a relatively hard substance with a very high melting point, very, very high melting point. Silicon carbide is another one. Um, and again, same idea, we've got carbons and they are bonded to silicons. Each one is gonna be bonded to some other carbons and silicons, but the, the base unit is one silicon to one carbon, 
repeated over and over and over again. And this particular one is even harder to melt. Um, it has a really high melting point because you have to try to separate those atoms away from each other and they are covalently bonded. Remember, normally when we talk about state changes, we're talking about breaking London forces between two different molecules. But essentially quartz and silicon carbide and diamonds, it's as if you're dealing with one giant molecule. So if you want to melt it, you're, you're not just breaking the intermolecular forces, you actually have to break the intramolecular forces, the covalent bonds that's holding them together. Ionic crystals are the fourth type that we're going to be looking at, and these ones we've probably seen around quite a bit, um, but essentially they consist of ions that are going to be held together by electrostatic attraction because of their opposite charges. And so we can think of a nice simple one like uh, sodium chloride. Um, with that one, we're going to have a three-dimensional shape based on how those ions are arranging themselves um, based on one, the ratio of ions, one, rate, one to the other. So in, in sodium chloride, it's a one to one ratio. But if it was something like magnesium chloride, it would be a one to two ratio. So based on the, the ion ratio, as well as the size of the ions involved, they're going to end up with some particular repeating pattern. Um, and that is essentially what gives the crystal shape for ionic compounds. Um, the properties of them is that because of the electrostatic attraction, each one of those, you can imagine if we've got sodium in the middle here and we've got chloride around it, it's not a sodium that's attracted to a chloride. It is a sodium that is actually surrounded, in this case, by six chloride ions. And every chloride ion is surrounded by six sodium ions. So trying to move them around is going to be relatively difficult because you're not just moving one ion away from another, you're moving one ion away from six other ions, which is going to take some amount of force. And so they do end up being quite hard. Um, they tend to have a relatively uh, high boiling point as well, for the same reason that they, they are hard, is it is hard to move them from one place to another because of that electrostatic attraction which is surrounding each ion because of course it's a three-dimensional solid. They are brittle however and that is because if you think of where the, the way they're lined up if you try to move one of them so let's say we're looking at this sodium ion here and this chloride ion here if we move if we if we hit the solid on this one side and these atoms move over a tiny bit instead of a sodium and chloride being lined up the so next sodium over will be found underneath the above sodium. So you end up with similar charges lining up if you give them some force. And so they tend to be very brittle because by giving them a little bit of force, causing a one layer to move one ion over, they're going to be repelled by the layer above it if it's not matched up in the proper way. And so they break relatively easily. They, they have quite a brittle structure to them because of that um, charged arrangement. Um, if you get them moving freely, which you can do in two ways, if you can get the ions moving around, they're going to be able to carry electrons, so they will be conductive, um, but you have to get them moving freely, so there's two ways to do that. One is to give them lots of energy. If you get them up to the point of melting, they can move freely and they will conduct electricity. Much easier way is to introduce water, which will help them to separate from each other because they, depending on the ionic crystal, may be attracted to the water and dissolve into the water. So the bonds are very strong, but because of the charges, they are directionally bonded. If you move one layer over, the layers will not be complementary, and instead you have a positive and a positive lining up, and therefore they will split apart. They are quite brittle. Last one is metallic crystals. And so if you take, um, let's deal with pure metals, so if you just take any metal from the periodic table, the reason why it doesn't fall apart, so you can imagine if you've got a gold bar, it's made up of just gold atoms, and they, you would think, would not be particularly attracted to each other. Um, it's, it would look at first glance kind of like a atomic solid, like when you deal with the noble gases. However, the thing about metals is they don't have a very strong hold on their electrons. So the valence electrons that are around these, oh, that's supposed to be an E, uh, around these atoms, those valence electrons aren't held on particularly close. So this second gold atom, its electron might move over closer to the first gold atom. 
and this first gold atom, its electron might move over close to the second one. And if you had a whole bunch of these guys, essentially their electrons are just going to be moving or they have the ability to move um, anywhere within that structure. And so what that means is if one of the atoms wanted to move away, um, it would have to pull its own electrons back out of the pool of electrons or the sea of electrons. And so this causes them to want to stay together to a certain extent. And so metals, depending on the metal, they're, they're more or less able to do this. And so metals tend to be relatively well held together or hard in terms of their properties. The, the electron, the atoms aren't particularly easy to separate. Um, but what's interesting is that if you do apply a force to them, so if you hit them, unlike a ionic crystal, the atoms that make up the metal, they don't care where they are. They don't have a particular spot to be. They're just as happy being anywhere. So if you move them from one place to another, they're just as happy in their new spot as they are in their old spot. So this allows them to be malleable. And that's, that's one of the properties we learn. We first learn about properties of, of different things. Um, but malleability is very common in metals because of the sharing of electrons and the fact that they don't really care where they are. They don't have directional bonding like ionic crystals do. This also allows them to wiggle around relative to each other pretty well. So they tend to be pretty good at conducting heat because again, whether they move up a little bit or down a little bit, the, their structure of the metal is not holding them in one particular place all that well. So they tend to conduct heat quite well. And of course, if the electrons are free to move, they can move through the metal, making it conductive.